Because if the pastor's not making disciples in his church, the church is probably not going to do it. You'll have a few people that might get moving and making disciples, but the pastor has to model it out, just like a head of a corporation has to model out what he wants. So that's how I would do it. If I were a pastor in a church, either I as a pastor would be modeling it. Number two, I or my somebody on my staff would be helping people understand the importance of it. I'd be preaching on it and I'd be showing people how to do it, how to get together with other people. I don't think just putting people together works real well, but if I can help people keep your eyes open, here's what to look for with maybe another potential candidate uh, test it out a little bit, see if the Lord's in those friendships, and then get with it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Disciple Dilemma. Dennis Allen with you, along with Raymond Monroe. We're talking with Dr. John Tolson today, the founder of Gathering USA. He's the author of The Four Priorities. He is the Jedi Knight of Making Disciples. This guy based in Dallas, Texas, has probably discipled more people than most of us know combined together. It's a terrific interview wide-ranging conversations about what it's like to disciple if you've never discipled before, what it's like to be a pastor trying to change a culture, and what it really means to get out and get at it as believers in Jesus Christ surrendered following disciples. Married to the beautiful Punky Tolson, John is with us today from Dallas, and it's a terrific interview. Here we go. Well, Dr. John Tolson with the Tolson Group, we're so thrilled to have you on The Disciple Dilemma. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Great to be here. And Raymond, where in the world are you again? <laughs> Down south of Austin, Texas. So really um, in a different place, but lots of fun, grandkids and all that stuff. So looking forward to the discussion. There's a lot of things that I want to hear about. So John, we're planning on unpacking an awful lot here today with you. Um, I've got to tell everybody that one of the most uh wonderful moments of the 2023 year was in November, getting to hear John talking at a seminar about the four priorities and just watching him work winsome, uh, very provocative, very profound, really just a lot of fun as well as people very interested in what's going on. John, why don't we kick it off with just a, maybe a minute recap on what in the world I just said with four priorities, what are you trying to do with disciples with the four priorities? The reason we, Came up with the four priorities. We felt that if I gave somebody a Bible, 66 books, a business person, I say I'm working with, and I said, go and disciple somebody, uh, they're probably not going to do it. But if I take out of the Bible key basic things and put those basic things in a book or a, a road map that they can go by, all based on the scripture, on the Bible, then you're going to have a much better chance of doing it. So basically, that's the main reason I came up with the four priorities. Also, mm -hmm. I think that if if you uh, look at everything that Jesus taught, every main principle in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, the principles there pretty much encapsulate everything he taught. So I love... I loved, uh, I love short versions. I'm a simple guy. Uh, cliff notes are, was my way to get through high school. Um, so I think this is a cliff note version right there of everything that Jesus taught. Wow. Okay, so I'm 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 just thinking about this for a minute, John. We got a lot of people in America that we got to try to get to Christ, and we got to get them discipled. Why can't we just put a thousand people in the pews, and you can just kind of give the speech, and we can get get through this a little faster? What 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 do I need this this one on one stuff for? Well, uh, most people have never had anyone give them attention and time in terms of walking with them, which we the term that I or spending time with them to help them uh, in terms of just having a friend. First of mm. all, most men in America, I would say men and women, I'm not sure, but most men in America are loners, even Christian men. 
So if you stick a, a thousand people in a pew and give a message on disciple making, chances are if you have five or 10 people step out and actually do this, it's a miracle. Five to 10 out of a thousand. It's that it's, tough, isn't it? Yes, sir. I remember years ago. Well, let me go back. So you got the thousand. The thousand are many of those people are what I call stowaways. It's like on a ship and they're, and they're stowed away. They don't have a ticket. And these people, maybe some of their tickets punched spiritually, they've received Christ, but no one has ever taken them on, walked with them, built certain basic principles and, and how to live life. You know, I can read a verse and hear great sermons, but what people miss is, how do I tie my spiritual shoes? How do I open the Bible and get some something out of it. How do I apply that when a kid is driving me crazy or my husband leaves me or my wife leaves me? Mm. How do I make decision, basic decisions of daily life based on this book? And so the four project helps do that. Yeah, John, John, okay. You've told me you got four principles. You said they came from Matthew 22. You said, I need that condensed version so I know what to do. What in the world are they? You told me there are four of them. What are they? I am so glad you asked because most people don't know what they are. Here they are. If you read the passage, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, soul, and strength. The second commandment is like it in the first. You love your neighbors, you love yourself. So the four that we see in there are these. Number one, a personal progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. So the second priority is a personal commitment, a personal commitment to loving yourself. And so what we try to teach in the four priorities and the second priority is his love is constant. It never changes. The third priority is a commitment to other believers. And that means if in your family, that means other believers that know Christ in your church or that you just have relationships with. And then the fourth commitment is a personal commitment to the work of Christ in the world. It has a two-prong uh, two prong approach. Number one, obviously meeting, reaching people for Christ, evangelism, and number two, a ministry of compassion. So those are the four priorities with a whole lot of meat and sub points on it. So I'm walking around uh, at this conference that John's hosted in November at Dallas Theological, and I'm bumping into people going, John, help me with this. John, help me with that. And what I'm what I'm kind of leaning into here, John, is that you seem to be saying something that Raymond and I find to be very rare in conversations. You've got to have somebody walk alongside you, not somebody in a pulpit, but somebody walking alongside you. How, how much time do you hang out with these people to get them kind of through this in general? Yeah, I think, well, let, let, let me try to, um, I try to model out what the people that I'm trying to equip and train to also disciple with others and walk with them. Uh, and so basically, when I meet with a person, an individual, it's about an hour, 15, hour and 20 minutes each time we meet. We'll probably do that for almost a year, maybe nine to 10 months. I just graduated a guy uh, from our time together. And we I don't think we missed one week meeting. And so we were done in about nine to 10 months. But it's not a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And it's not just about the content. It's about the relationship. And what most people are starved for are friendships and relationships. But in the context of that, in the amount of time we spend, a whole lot can be done and invested. Now, I may have other times when they'll come over to the house for dinner, when we'll take them out to lunch. We might go have a game of golf. And we're not studying at that time, but that we're dealing with everyday life and things that we do and activities. So that, you know, I feel that if a person's got a hundred and uh, 66 hours a week. And if you add up everything you do during a week, amount of time you work, sleep, exercise, whatever, and you add all that up and subtract it from the number of hours in a week, you still are going to have 20 to 25 hours you can't account for. And even the busiest people I know, I pretty much, they've all come out with more hours and they don't know where they've gone.
I want to explore something with you that is endemic in discipleship in the West, and that is how many pastors have been through a mentoring life and relationship before they got to the pulpit? You've been around a while. What do you hear? What do you what do you know about that? I I think, excuse me, I think many of them have had individuals who've made little or even large deposits in their life over the years. But a, but an individual that has walked with them over a sustained period of time, I very few, very few. And I would say my guess is some people have done some research on this, but I'd say above 90 percent have never had anybody to walk with them. We had uh, uh, Cindy Perkins with the Bonhoeffer Project on and their stats said that it is. Uh, at the most, when you think about the deposit idea you just brought up, 20%, but it's more likely 5% and below pastors, seminaries, never mentored or disciple at all anywhere in their life. They just yeah. became converted. They learned theology. They know that the discipleship sermon is part of the routine somewhere once a year. And is that is that an issue for people, John? They've never done it, so why should I start now? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do it. Is that is that what you're really doing? You're helping people learn how to not be afraid of this thing? Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, are very hesitant for a number of reasons. They think they're not qualified. They think that's the profession, prof the professional's job. They think that uh, they don't know enough, uh, et cetera, and, and the excuses go on and on and on. But I think that um, what we're trying to do is help people understand, first of all, this is this is a command by Christ. So if it's a command, we don't pick and choose the commands we're going to do. If it's a command, we need to keep in mind what it is and attempt to do by his grace and through his spirit what he's asking us to do. But that doesn't mean we don't need help in knowing how to do it. You know, there's a University of Southern California professor said that modeling is their greatest means of communication. So I think if they can watch somebody do it right in front of them and they're modeling certain behaviors, lifestyles, schedules, priorities, et cetera, and then you're able to interact with somebody and talk about those things and see how they would apply it to their everyday life, I think you're going to hit a home run with that. And most people have had not, not had that experience. And being a mentor, in my estimation, and a disciple maker is two different things. Mostly, when you think of a mentor, somebody in a profession or whatever that spends time, somebody older spends time with somebody younger, and how do you, how do you be a better uh, real estate person or whatever the field of, or the endeavor is? So what we're trying to do is to help people know what it is God's calling them to do in the Scripture, make disciples, how to go about that by discipling them, that's ideal, and then setting them loose to do that. How do we get there from where we are? That's a tough question. Uh, and I think that's been around for a long time. It's very interesting that I know uh, pastors and preachers that they're one way when they get up, front they come alive and then when they get down among the people they it's almost like they have no sh social skills mm -hmm. and that's sad uh but it's true but another feature of that i think that scares pastors is this that I, years ago i worked with a man who was a gigantic uh leader in our country and a pastor and i remember sitting with him one time with our staff and we kept pushing him to, for us in our group to of, of, lead, of uh, staff, full-time staff, to share our heart, share what's going on, da, 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 and be a little more vulnerable and whatever, pray for one another and whatever. And finally, one day, he just hit his desk, and he said, man, let me tell you something. Years ago in another city, I was with a little group of men, and finally, I shared something that was very personal. And I felt good about that until six months later, I was in, all the way on the other side of the country. And somebody said they heard something about that I had shared in that room. 
And part of our commitment was confidentiality, and somebody was not holding to that. He said, I've had it with that. So sometimes preachers get burned, and they don't know who they can trust. And so how do you do that? I think there's always going to be a risk involved, but you got to take the risk. Well, and these are really important thoughts for us because I think in the conversations I'm having with a lot of pastors, they're told, and Raymond was hinting at this, don't get close to the people in the room. Stay away because they'll burn you. Is it? When, when you think about your experience in churches, because you've pastored in churches before, is that is that a commonplace uh, policy, philosophy, way of thinking, or is that just sort of nobody ever tells you that, but you just pick it up instinctively, stay away from people, don't get close to people? How does that work in the institutional church? Well, I think I think the way people come up with that is, like you all said, Somebody tells them, maybe even when they were in graduate school or seminary, you know, don't get too close. But I think the other thing is that um, a lot of people have pastors have seen other pastors that have been burned. So they say they stay time out. Am I going to get too close? Only going to go so far. And the other thing I would say is a lot depends on the personality of the pastor. If he's, if he's a people person and a little more outgoing, you're going to see him out there and he's willing to take the risk, even to talk about it from up front. So Jim Davis and Michael Graham have written a book called The Great Dechurching. And The Great Dechurching um, was a study in sociology. They spent a lot of money to sample about 39,000 people. And one of the statistics they came up with is that in the last 18 years, 40, four zero million believers have walked off on their faith. How should we think about that kind of a statistic relative to discipleship? Are we just not preaching enough sermons? Or is the root cause of what we're seeing the failure to disciple people? Dr. Tolson, what do you think? Well, Dr. Also says it's a failure to make disciples. So at the luncheon uh, uh, that I spoke at on Wednesday, we do it 12 times a year here in Dallas, and business leaders and company owners and so forth come to this, and they and we have table leaders and they fill their tables up with people that they feel need to be there. So I got a note uh, yesterday, actually, yeah, it was last night. I got a note from one of our table hosts. He said, I had a guy at my table. He was 20 years old. And the 35 minute talk that you gave, he took three or four pages of notes. So number one, in that age range of that, in that 40 million people, there are a lot of younger people. We know that. And I think number one, if you give them attention, you give them your life, you come to the point, you scratch where they itch, you give them something of value and of substance, they will absolutely be all over you. But they want their life to matter, and we got to shoot straight with them. And I think that works. That's what I do. I mean, I disciple a lot of people in their 20s and early 30s, and they, they have, they're, they're astounding with their commitment. What do you sense are, is the is the challenge that the institutional church is facing to make disciples? Then, if we were to, if we were to step back and say, is something missing in discipleship? What would the coach John Tolson give to the broader evangelical church as a as a few points? You've got a hundred you got a hundred pastors in the room, John. These are big pastors, and they're listening to you and they're taking notes, right? What are you going to say to the institutional leaders of these churches about what we've been talking about? What do you want them to hear? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I care about the pastors most of all, because if the pastor's not making disciples in his church, the church is probably not going to do it. You'll have a few people that might get moving in making disciples, but the pastor has to model it out 
just like a head of a corporation has to model out what he wants and so uh, and what he expects. So I think I try to tell, and I've been with pastors, and I tell them, number one, the same thing I tell an average person. Hey, you know, when I open this book up, it tells me he gave us the mission. He said, go make disciples. But the question is, pastor, what do you think that means? Because what I'm finding, you guys, is a lot, there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of misconceptions about what Matthew 28, go make disciples, means. So I try to find out what they think it means, and then I try to bring some thought and clarity to what I think it means through study and so forth. And I'll often, and when we do one of our summits, and you've been to one, uh, Dennis, the first, if we do it like on a Friday night and then a Saturday until noon, when I'm done Friday night, after we've talked about what is discipling, why it's important, what's an overview of it, et cetera, at the end of it, here's what people say. Number one, number one, I had no idea of what it meant. Number two, I did not understand it was my responsibility. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to help the pastors understand it is your responsibility. Who are you discipling, Mr. Pastor? I got another example of a guy I talked with the other day. And he said, you know, in my church, they're into disciple making. I asked him a question. Big church, is your pastor making disciples? He said, I don't know. I have to ask him. If that pastor was understanding disciple making and was doing it, my thought is you would know about it. I have a doctor friend we have discipled. He goes to a big church up 75 here in Dallas. And he goes to his pastor about two or three times a year for three or four years after he, the doctor started discipling and he talked to the pastor and he said, what are we doing with disciple making? What are we doing with disciple making? Finally, there is a breakthrough and the pastor gets it and he starts discipling. And not only that, now he's got his whole staff discipling and some of the staff say, you know, all he can talk about is making disciples. Wow. If you are making disciples as a pastor, you know it. If you don't know what it means or, or you're not doing it, man, that's where we can come in and Dennis and others can come in and we can really help you get moving. It is the most important thing you can do. So, so John, John, one of the... One of the big challenges that I see, at least, and that we've talked with people about, is this reductionist view that Christianity is conversion and getting my get out of hell free card, and disciple making is teaching people to evangelize. Yeah. And yet, um, how much of what you do when you're working with somebody for a year is about teaching them to be an evangelist, and how much of it is living out the Christian life and love for other people? Most studies say that 95% of believers, Christians, have never led one person to Christ. So, you know, if, if you want to move beyond evangelism, we haven't even moved to it yet. You know, the statistics are there. And so I, I said, when I was in Orlando last week speaking, I made a challenge to a bunch of people. And I said, most of y'all know Matthew chapter 20, excuse me, chapter 4, verse uh, 19. Jesus called his disciples, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men or women. I said, how many of you are fishing? And I said, let me give you something to think about. If you're not fishing, you ain't following. I don't blame, in our day and time, the last three or four years in our country, I don't blame the non-believer for the trouble going on. I blame the Christian for not getting out there and building into lives of people, bringing people to Christ, getting them discipled so that that multiplication can begin and that healthy maturing process can really go to town. I don't see that. I blame the Christian. And I played sports all the way through college. And let me tell you, I didn't like to sit on the bench, but we've got too many people that have, are Christians that have, that have become accustomed and comfortable on the bench and that is not the game <laughs> and i'll tell you who else i blame i blame the pastor pastor we're gonna follow you we're gonna follow you well if he's not following jesus in disciple making that's one of the big reasons it's not going on
Now, aren't we really sort of forcing um, pastors to be brand managers, to be institution managers and organization managers? In other words, am I not really, as, as the as the elder board in your church, really looking at you and going, John, look, I'm expecting some market share growth here. I'm looking for more of these butts in the seats. I'm looking for the offering plate to be a little fuller and, you know, some entertaining stuff, good music, give me some really good TED Talks, stuff that, you know, makes me feel good. I can drop the kids off at Sunday school. Don't we foist a lot of that on our pastors today? That's your number one job? You know, there is a, yes, there is a uh, uh, thing that, an app that I somebody sent me called Church Staffing. And you can go on there and it tells you the opportunities around the country where there are different positions opened in a church. So every once in a while, I'll look through that and I'll go on to a particular church uh, and their, what they expect of the next pastor. It goes something like that. I mean, it goes bigger than it goes from a ceiling to the floor. And these expectations are there that no one could, God couldn't even do them. I mean, it's ridiculous. So yes, I do think we put on, on uh, many pastors, a big list of things to do. That's why there's something to this whole movement. Uh, some good, some bad, the simple church, just, just do the basic stuff and care for people and, and do it well but go about this whole thing of investing in people to invest in people to invest in people. At the rate that we are currently um, shrinking as a Protestant evangelical church in the U S right now. So if you, if you think about the numbers, right, we, we often will brag that, Still, forty-eight percent of the population of the U.S. claims to be Christian, and of that, so that that should put us ish around 150, 160 million people. And then we say that there's fifty-two ish million people attending church right now, even though there's three x that number who claim to be Christians. But what I'm noticing, John, is this same thing that you're setting up that. We're moving a lot of furniture from church to church to church. We've got a lot of people going from church A to church B who's already saying, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm just trying to go where I get fed a little bit. Having now been in Dallas for 20 years, the longer I'm here, the deeper relationships I have, the more I see happen, the growth in people's lives and the impact and influence. And if I'm just flitting every two or three years from one city to the next city to the next city, one church to the next church to the next church, and never sink in, uh, it's, uh, n- number one, I'm, in- I'm impacting my own development and growth as a follower of Jesus. Number two, I'm also impacting the church that I'm in, hopping mm-hmm. in, hopping out, hopping in, hopping out, and I am not don't have that longevity view of digging in and sinking in into a body and being a part of that body and all that that implies. I 100% agree with you that that affects the disciple-making process. John, how important do you think it is that every Christian person within your church has at least one or two really deep friendships with two or three people that are actually in the church? I actually believe that's very important. (laughs) If, uh, you know, that's the third priority. If you go to the third priority in the four priority book, we have a section on there. No, I I don't think we call it this, but no more Lone Ranger Christians. But there needs to be something deeper going on at some point in your life with two or three other people. Uh, So today I just got away from uh, time with three of my friends we meet together every Thursday for at least an hour and a half, sometimes two and a half hours more. And b- b- we all go to the same church. And those are my buddies that I'm with. And that's where I look for direction. That's where I look for them to ask me good questions, sometimes tough questions. That's where I get my greatest encouragement other than with my wife and my family and There is so much in that. So I'm thinking of a passage over here in Philippians, Philippians chapter two, verse 25. And this is what it says. This is a, this is a great verse, but I think Paul said it necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, 
my fellow soldier. And it's got three categories there. And I think what I've learned over the years is very few people have brother or sister relationships in a church that are deeper, like we're talking about. We have a lot of fellow worker, fellow soldier. Yeah, we'll get in and do a project and we'll go on a mission trip and we'll we'll, we'll work in the parking lot and parking cars. Nothing wrong with that. But you also have to focus on those brother or sister relationships in the body of a church. I think that's right, John. And so one of the questions I have is I've, I've at least come to the conclusion that that's as, a, as an essential part of discipleship and disciple making is being a disciple. And being a disciple means having those relationships. So my earlier question was really, how do we move people from learning techniques about how to get close to people and share Christ with them to the place where they're actually deeply involved in community, where they have friends who are encouraging them and they're living out the life because they're really deeply involved in other people's lives. So that's how I would do it. If I were a pastor in a church, either I as a pastor would be modeling it. Number two, I or my somebody on my staff would be helping people understand the importance of it. I'd be preaching on it and I'd be showing people how to do it, how to get together with other people, I don't think just putting people together works real well, but if I can help people keep your eyes open, here's what to look for with maybe another potential candidate, uh, test it out a little bit and see if the Lord's in those friendships and then get with it. Okay. So one of the things that I'm hearing you kind of lead off with is to the pastors, you first guys, if you're not discipling, you might as well just push it off to the side and forget about it. It is not going to happen unless you're doing it first, right? I agree. For uh, as far as the church overall, you're yeah, not the church gonna overall. Do it if you're not doing it. The second thing that I'm hearing you talk about is it can be very challenging trying to pair up and team up people inside of a church, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to encourage these people that they need that two or three like you got alongside you who can see through your soul and know when things are and are not okay. That's an important piece you've just told us today. Yes. Yeah, I think I think if if we understand what how Jesus operated, you know, he had the 12 and then the inner core of the three, Peter, James, and John. And most people say who studied this and say John knew his heartbeat more than anybody else. Um, I don't know, but I think there is a model there. Everybody need you got the bigger group, but then you got a that tight little group, that band of people. You know, but another way to studies have been done on this and reality says it, that if you have one or two close friends in your lifetime that really are like we're talking about, they're with you, they're going to do whatever, they're going to be whatever they need to be for you. They're going to be your side. They're going to encourage they're all that. They're going to be friends. You're going to have a great time together, fun time, but serious times. If you have one or two in your lifetime, you've been blessed. What do you think is the challenge of doing that? I mean, we're saying that the, one of the biggest challenge pastors face is the inability, the, the, the fact to begin with that they don't have that already and the inability to do that. How do we, is that a skill that we teach people? Is that a miracle that they need to pray for? <laughs> what is it? You know, I don't think, again, you can mass produce this. I wish we could. I wish we could just snap our fingers over a church and boom, all of a sudden it would happen. But I think one of the ways you can do that is uh, by uh, modeling it as one, but in a local church to be able to raise up, continually be raising up people that are going to be these people that are looking for people to begin to band together with. Somebody's got to initiate it. Sometimes God will just put a group together, three or four people, two or three people. I'm not talking about small groups now. That's another deal. I'm talking about within the life of your church in relationships, that two or three, that two or three that you are banded together with and sometimes for life. How often is that my responsibility as somebody who's learned how to make friends to really seek out the pastor 
and develop that sort of private relationship where it's not a public thing. It's not, but it is once a week or once every other week having lunch together and just talking about what it means to follow Jesus. I think that's critical. I've got a buddy who is a, a well-established man in this city, been here for a long time, uh, business-wise, well-established, all that. He goes to an Episcopal church, and the rector of his church, he does that with almost every week. He meets with him. They often will take he and his wife to dinner. Uh, they often will travel together if possible. But But he now, by the way, Dennis, you're going to love this. So I got a guy that I discipled and just released him from our discipling commitment about um, two weeks ago. I gave him this book, Dennis, your book. He went out, he read it immediately. He read it in a week. He ordered 10 more books and gave them out and sent them around the country and here in Dallas. He took one to his rector. Now, his rector is really a neat guy. And got a great church here in Dallas. But he asked uh, about a month or two ago, he asked my buddy that I was discipling. He said, uh, Jeff, he said, um, you're different. He said, what do you mean? He said, you're just more passionate about Jesus and about your faith. And and this guy's a you know tough old business guy. He said, well, there's this guy I know. And we've been meeting together, going through, and he gave, he gave his rector one of these. <laughs> so now he read the whole book in a week and then the next thing jeff said well you need to this one to see why we're missing this and then we need to get this started in our church so the guy wow. absolutely the rector's blown away with a change in one man's life that he loves that spends time with him and i can't wait to see and not only that but this particular rector has his his uh, tentacles out in rectors all over the country. I love the fact that you're making all of these congregations radioactive with the work you're doing. Well, I sure want to, because, you know, I don't, as, as my pastor says, God doesn't have a backup bride. It's the church. John, I want to round this off uh, with a question, and I want you to have the last minute when we get done with this. But the question I want to pose to you in the area of discipleship right now is, what do you see as the toughest cultural challenges that are pushing back on the guys you've discipled and the disciples you're going to disciple? What's the most toxic cultural stuff you think you're facing right now? Marching for a business leader to march to the uh, drumbeat of the culture and some of the basic tenets of the culture and success, which includes what you said and so much more, to me is in, in a lack of spiritual faith depth. And there's a lot of people, as you know, skimming on the top of their faith, but they really don't have much of a foundation. I'm buying this. Now I want to now I want to ask you this kind of closing question and and then you get your minute. Right here it is. It is that John, I love everything that you've said and I'm <laughs> living in Timbuktu Nowheresville and I got nobody. I've never been discipled. I'm in a church, maybe I'm the pastor, but I've never been discipled. I got nobody around me being discipled and you're freaking in Dallas, Texas, John, with your book. What, what do I do, John? Oh, I do I have an answer for you. This she does come in. I have in I have discipled folks all over this country on the telephone in a FaceTime or Zoom call every week, hour, hour, 15 minutes. And now we got one up in Nashville, Tennessee, a guy that's starting a whole men's movement based upon disciple making. I got a guy down in Houston, Texas, Trey's his name. He just sent me a note the other day. He's been discipling now for over 10 years. He said, well, I just got my next two guys. Mm. I do it right here. Take the book, read a chapter. Let's talk about it. How are we going to live it out till we get through it? Then you take somebody. Are you actually reachable, John Tolson? Uh, it all depends. <laughs> yes, I'm reachable. You have my information, but also. Tell you one quick story. 
I met with a pastor, somebody introduced me to from Oklahoma three weeks ago. He came to my office. He is preaching every Sunday in his little country church, the four priorities. Wow. He's the scripture, the topic, and teaching it. He said, I'm going to be doing that for a year. I got a bunch of sermons. I said, I know there's good, some good stuff in there. <laughs> I'm loving this conversation. Folks, as we're finishing up here, you're seeing the website for the Tolson Group, for John Tolson's work, for the four priorities. Of course, you can pick the book up anywhere. It's out there everywhere. John's got seminars and sessions going on. John, uh, as we wrap up, I'm thinking that uh, you get the last minute, and I'm wondering if you want to say something to our crew that gives them a little bit of a burr in the saddle as we wrap up today. Yeah, I think um, I would. I don't think I know this. Let me tell you something. I am getting ready in about four or five days to turn 80 years old, and my energy level in life is as great as it's ever been kind of like caleb he said i'm 85 give me a, give me the mountain we've got we've got to get off the bench and get in the game and this is what this is what disciple making is it's a learner a follower and a reproducer and that's what he's called all, and we're all reproducing something but what are you reproducing and if there's anything that dennis or Raymond, or I, myself, or others, that we can, we will do anything to help you. If you're a pastor, a lay person, you just let us know, and we'll do anything we can do to get you going. Hmm. John Tolson's got a great story. Take a look at his website. This is wonderful. Dr. John Tolson, thank you for being with us today on The Disciple Dilemma. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks, Dennis. You guys are best, the best. Keep doing it. Would you help the church think more about discipleship? Would you help us get the conversation started to talk about the biblical discipleship Jesus gave us? Please follow us. Our website, www.thediscipledilemma.com. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and all the RSS feeds. If you'd follow or like us, you'll help us get leverage in the digital marketplace to talk about the fact that discipleship needs to be talked about. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.